grandmother uh, was Inge Strauss Grundell, um, born uh, June 29, 1919 in Hamburg, Germany. My grandfather had a business in Hamburg. He patented a hairnet and had a factory. And um, he did not really accept that uh, the politics would become so bad. There were a lot of uh, a lot of Germans who did deny that things could get worse, that um, you know it would all blow over, and everything they had was there. And so he was of that uh, frame of mind. He was <clears throat> he was a German through and through, and he um, he wanted to stay. Unfortunately, Mum lost her mother when she was very young. Her mother took ill. Uh, when she was in her 40s. War hadn't quite uh, amounted to what it would become in subsequent years, but mom was very, very sad. After Kristallnacht in uh, November of 38, you know, the burning of the books and the Jewish synagogues and Jewish businesses were all raided in the night of broken glass. Everything changed, you know, very dramatically after that time. And um, my grandfather was actually imprisoned. He was taken prisoner. They rounded up all the Jewish men in uh, Hamburg and uh, he was taken to prison for three months. And uh, I believe he was severely beaten. He never spoke of it. He said that he would speak to my mother about what happened when the war was over. And uh, so we never heard really what happened. But Mom moved out of her flat, her sister, and she lived there for a couple of years with my father, my grandfather's business partner and family. Um, and then Mom's younger sister, Ruth, uh, at the age of 17, was sent to London to work as a housemaid. That was in August of 1939, just two weeks before the um, Germans invaded Poland and the war started September 1st, 1939. She met a man uh, when she was in her late teens who had lost his wife and they had a very young son together. His uh, son's name was Michi. And um, mom ended up marrying this man who was uh, about 17 years older than she. Um, his name was Herbert Pick. Shortly after they married, uh, they were transported, uh, deported to, um, to the Lodge Ghetto in Poland. And Mickey and uh, my mom and uh, her husband, Herbert, were deported by train from Hamburg to, um, to Ludge. This doctor, this Jewish doctor, who was somehow or another privileged to information, said, I want you to pack warm food, warm clothes, and food and um, I want you to be prepared, you know, with any medicines that you have. And this is the rucksack that mom actually packed up and she took into the camps with her. Stayed with her for many years because it arrived in Syracuse when she did yeah. in 1949. But she had a number of different jobs oh. over a period of yeah. about two and a half years there. Some of it was stringing wire, very thin wires through telephone cords and preparing munitions for the Germans, believe it or not. She was sent, selected, in February of uh, 44 to, uh, she and um, about 90 women, to go work in a munitions factory uh, in the nearby area called Chestahova. And um, it really saved her life because Ludge Ghetto was completely liquidated by July and August of uh, 1944. Mm -hmm. And there in Chestahova, she did produce ammunition. She was there until uh, the Russians invaded uh, the camp, Chestahova, in uh, January of 1945. And she was liberated just because uh, the Germans abandoned yeah. the entire camp. Sure. That was January 17th, 1945. And people scattered all over yeah. and in the town. And uh, she took shelter in a building with other people. Mm -hmm. It was a very active war zone yeah. at that time. And she was injured. Um, and they stayed. They scrounged for any food, drink that they could have. And my father escaped on a death march 
uh, right about that time from Auschwitz. He and six other men um, escaped on that particular death march and he took refuge also in Czestochowa in the town and that's where he met my mother and he tended to her needs. He tended to her first aid needs. She needed help and he bandaged her and uh, I think my father fell in love with her at first sight. I know my mom needed some help and she um, was not in a position to say no and um, he made it very clear that he was going where she was going, uh, unbeknownst to her, but uh, it was the beginning. They got married, uh, they together were picked up and uh, they were given refuge uh, in a DP camp, displaced persons camp. Uh, in an area of Hamburg. Your mother uh, wrote someone after she was liberated. Yes. This is the dated uh, the 29th of May 1945. This is my mother's handwriting. She is writing to her sister who was in England, in London. My darling Ruth, I am so happy because I can write you today. My sweet sister, I have truly the wish to know that you are living like I. Where is our dear father? I have lost all I have. Nothing, only myself. Darling, I can't wait to see you, my sweet sister. You don't know what happened in the years. A thousand kisses, your sister Inga. This is a copy of the ship's manifest that brought my mother and my father and my sister Marion to New York Harbor. They left um, Bremerhaven, that is the north of um, uh, Germany, and near Hamburg. <clears throat> so my father Herbert was 32, my mother Inga 30, Marion was two years old, and here is um, where they were going to be moved to, which is 201 East Jefferson Street in Syracuse in the 15th Ward District. Well, they were sponsored by the um, Jewish Federation through the American Jewish Joint Distribution, and the Syracuse Federation saw to it that they had some communal housing when they came to the country. They were living um, on East Genesee Street, very near where the Jewish Community Center was located, and they were uh, there were four families, including them, couples with one child who was relatively the same age and they shared a kitchen and a bathroom and they each had their own separate rooms to live in. And from there they moved to, uh, uh, I guess, Jefferson, Harrison or Jefferson Street? I don't know what this address is, but I think they lived on Harrison Street after that. And, uh, and then my brother Danny was born in 1951. She was able to really um, heal a lot of herself uh, through uh, very creative means. She wrote poetry. It was all intended to be just private for herself, but my sister saw this collection of handwritten uh, notes that my mother had uh, somewhere in the 80s, and um, it was a compilation of her thoughts, her, her sorrow, her dreams, uh, the reality of her life here. Um, her life as a widow after my father passed away, and what it was like to live um, as an older woman, yeah. you know, on her own. And she, um, Marion, compiled that beautiful collection of um, notes and poetry and put it into a beautiful book which she called Red Roses, the uh, poetry of Inga Grundell. Here is a poem, it is called Dignity, and it is so raw and it is um, written from a flashback that my mother had while she was, you know, in the camps. Dignity. I was standing in the nude, an order from the SS. I lowered my eyes and turned red with shame. I felt immoral and was in distress. And then God said to me, I was still the same. Deprived of food, clothes, and liberty, I thought this was the end, and then I saw God shielding me and he raised my head with his hand. He wrapped me in a robe of dignity. God opened my eyes and I saw a beast, dressed in the uniform of the SS. I was not naked nor ashamed, not the least. I was not I, but them who should have felt distress.
My mom always had a beautiful voice. Um, and she had a very deep voice. And uh, as a young, as a teenager growing up in Nazi Germany, uh, there came a time when the only freedom that Jews had was at the Jewish coffee houses in where she lived in Hamburg. And uh, it was the only place Jews could congregate. And mom wanted to sing cabaret. And so she asked her father, who was a relatively um, tough guy, you know, he was very strict and he forbid her from singing in the coffee houses. And uh, so that desire never left mom because one night, quietly alone, probably in the 80s, mom waited her 40 years or whatnot to record her cabaret music. And she put on a, she put on an album that had music she was very familiar with and she knew growing up and um, it was only instrumentals. And she put on the record, she put on her boom box with the microphone attached to it. And I don't know how many times she practiced because it is a beautiful compilation of songs that mom is singing to. She is narrating throughout, you know, her singing. And it sounds like the band is playing to her. Well, she Mom did that decades ago, but do you know that we did not discover that music until um, two weeks before she died? <clears throat> I was going through her music and we were playing and keeping things light and uh, put it on and she just was radiant and remembers, you know, singing that and making it and uh, it's something I listen to all the time is mom's music. The most beautiful lesson of my mother's life is how she learned to live again and she learned to love and uh, she was so full of love. Paris, je t'aime. 